Hey, I'm Jake Lizio, and in this video, we're going to be writing and producing three different genres of music using only the Aeolian mode. And that's just a fancy way of saying the minor scale. There actually is kind of a difference between Aeolian and minor, but I really don't want to talk about that at the beginning of the video. Let's save that for the end. I'd like to start off with the fun stuff and just get right into the composing. There is a little music theory you should know first, and that's how do you build a minor scale and how do you build the chords of a minor scale? So I have gone through all of that stuff in my video on minor. You should be able to find it here or check below in the description. But let's get started. I decided I wanted to write a really juicy, dancey funk section, something like Daft Punk, or Chromio or Jamiroquai. I chose the key of B flat minor simply because we haven't used any flat keys yet, and I kind of expected that maybe a horn player would show up for this jam, but I never actually recruited a horn player for this jam. So anyways, we're using the B flat minor scale, and like before, I think it's a great idea to just start off with maybe just playing around with the scale, go up and down it, jump around it, see what happens, and by doing that, I ended up with this very simple pattern that sounds like this. And you can see it really only uses five notes of the scale. It uses the notes of the pentatonic minor. But it doesn't sound very funky, does it? It's far away from being a funk groove. And the reason for that is because the rhythm is so boring. I'm just playing straight eighth notes. One and two and three and four and one. If I decide to get syncopated instead by taking some of these notes and not putting them on the beat, but putting them in between the beat, so on those 16th notes in between, what I could get is something like this. One, two, E, uh, E, four, and one, two, E, uh, E, four. Clearly a more interesting rhythm. And if we speed that up to a dance tempo, this is way funkier than what we started with. And it's the exact same set of notes, it's the exact same sequence in the same pattern, just changing the rhythm to be more syncopated and therefore more funky. By palm muting this exact same pattern, it's going to get even funkier because funk traditionally has a staccato kind of poking nature to it. So a lot of these guitar parts you're going to hear me palm mute, and that way they're a little more muted, they're not so legato, but much more staccato. Now I am going to make one small little change to my riff, just to my own liking. Instead of this quarter note at the beginning, one, two, E, a, E, a, four, and one, I'm actually going to change it to, to two eighth notes. One and two, E, a, E, a, four, and one and two, E, a, E, a, four, and one. Just sounds a little funkier to me, more to my liking. So we've got this cool little guitar riff here, but we still don't have a funk section. We really need to start thinking about chords. So let's look at the B flat minor scale and think about the chords in B flat minor. And let's listen to what it would sound like if we play a B flat minor in the background of this riff. Sounds pretty good. Let's listen to what it sounds like if we play the four chord E flat minor. And I think that sounds pretty good too. So that was the idea I had. Let's play the riff consistently four times. But the first three times, we're gonna have a B flat minor chord playing out. And then that last time, we'll have the four chord, which is E flat minor ringing out. And what that sounds like, again, is this. B flat, B flat, E flat, B flat. Now, I didn't really like the way that this riff sat over the E flat minor chord. It's a little bit of clashing, it didn't, they didn't merge together. So I decided to change the riff a little bit that fourth time so it helps outline my E flat minor chord. For example, instead of starting here on this note, B flat, I started the riff on an E flat note. That instantly helps accent this new chord. Then I keep this little hammer on the same, and then I bring in this note, G flat. We haven't seen a G flat at all in this riff yet, so it's finally appearing here. And then I end this little riff with the note C, which is another note we haven't seen. But with that note C appearing and with that note G flat appearing, we have now played all of the notes of B flat minor. So we are really clearly using the B flat minor scale here. No confusion to what key we are really in, using all seven notes of B flat minor with this riff three times and then this riff once. So we've got our progression of B flat minor, B flat minor, B flat minor, and E flat minor. 
The second time, we're gonna do the same thing. B flat minor, B flat minor, B flat minor. But if you take an E flat minor, and if you just slap a C on the bass, what you get is a C half diminished. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make sure that later on you hear the keyboards and the bass guitar really accenting that low C. That way we feel a little bit of diminished flavor in there. You could think of this as an E flat minor sixth that's just being inverted, but to me it's really, it's function here, it's context is gonna be a C half diminished resolving us back to a B flat minor. Next, I wanted to add another guitar part, and I thought a line that would work very well is something very sparse, very staccato, that just kind of outlines the chord tones, right? So for this B-flat minor chord, what I decided to do, just sliding up to the minor third there, and just keep hammering away at it with some palm mutes and some staccato, and what that's going to do is just kind of complement that chord a little bit, but not get too much in the way of the rest of the band. Once again, when the E-flat minor chord comes up, I'm just outlining a little bit of each chord as it pops up. But this kind of line works really, really well with a lot of compression. You can see I panned it kind of to one side of the speaker, and uh, it helps merge between the Rhodes keyboard and the other guitar part very well. Now, up until this point, we've ignored the most important thing about funk and dance, which is rhythm. Rhythm is really key to making people dance. So let's start talking a little bit about what we can do to make this sound like a dance track. I started off with a simple little percussion loop that I added effects to. From there, I sent the track to the one and only Beardstank. And I knew he would give me a great drum part from then which I could craft a bass line. I didn't want to write a bass line and then say, hey, write a groove for this bass line. I'd rather have somebody who is a rhythm expert give me a really nice funky groove and then I can help complement that groove with my bass guitar. <laughs> So to write a bass part, I was really thinking about the same rhythms that Beardstank was playing. You'll notice he's got an accent on that one, two, uh, ian, one, two, uh, ian. So I'm thinking of those notes, and I'm also thinking of the B flat minor scale. I also want to bring up though that that flat seven is, in my opinion, the funkiest interval. We start off our riff with a root to a flat seven, and then up to the root. And I really can't think of anything funkier than going from a root to a flat seven to another root. And even on the low octave, root, flat seven, root, it's just as funky as it gets. And I mean, try other intervals, really. I'm not messing around here. Try like, you know, try a, a, a fifth or a, a sixth. Or, they don't sound as funky. I think maybe the only one that comes close is the minor third. That's kind of funky, but like a fifth doesn't funk. All on its own. A major seventh certainly doesn't. But that flat seven, it's about as funky as an interval can get. So when my brain is thinking funk, one of the words that pops up in my brain is flat sevens, minor sevens, they always have that funk feel. So it's no surprise that my fingers kind of naturally went to flat sevens for my bass line. Now obviously when the E flat minor chord comes around, I'm accenting that E flat minor, but remember the second time the E flat chord comes around, I want to be accenting the C note to kind of create that appearance and that sound of a C half diminished instead. So this is starting to come together pretty well, but it's missing vocals. And really, if you want a Chromeo song or a Daft Punk song, you need a vocal track that everybody can sing along to. Now, I ain't no singer, but I do have pitch correction software, so it worked out pretty well in this case. What I decided to do is write some lyrics and then sing them in a low register. Ooh, I've got a secret that I think I wanna tell you. Then I took that same track and sang it two more times. That way I had a thick triple track. Ooh, I've got a secret that I think I wanna tell you. And that's when I started processing it with Melodyne. So not only were my pitches correct, but also my timing was really cleaned up between all three performances. Ooh, I've got a secret that I think I'm gonna tell you. Then I did that all over again, singing in my best falsetto voice. Putting those two together gives you a really nice thick stack of vocals. Ooh, I've got a secret that I think I'm gonna tell you. 
but I decided to add even more. I took one of my high tracks and artificially pitched it up an entire octave, and that way it was annoyingly high and really stuck out just a little bit in the mix so you would notice it in your subconscious. And then finally, two more vocal tracks that were really just my vocals processed through Isotope's vocal synth to give me some robotic goodness. But there was one thing I noticed. In between my vocals, I have these little pockets of space. Ooh, I got a secret that I think I want to tell you. And pockets are something to look out for. Whenever you see one of those pockets, that's telling you that there's like room for something. You could put a guitar lick there, a drum fill there, something that is just waiting to catch the listener's attention for that little tiny space. So what I opted for was some vocoded synthesizer. Basically just singing the part you heard, but running it through a synthesizer so it kind of sounds like a robot synth. Then on the second pocket, I decided to add in a little synth line that you might recognize. Now the little melodic line that I played there is literally 100% stolen from Sonic 2 Chemical Plant Zone. Like initially I improvised a little idea on the keyboard and then later on I'm like, oh, that sounds like Sonic. And then I decided, why not just steal from Sonic? Like no one's gonna care. I don't think you guys care. I thought it was funny. It's a funny little reference. Uh, it's not like I ripped off the whole song, but that's a sick keyboard line and I have no shame in just borrowing it for this. And lastly, at the very, very end, it was just screaming for a little bit of keyboard solo. Now we know that everything has been in B flat minor, correct? But a good lead player doesn't care about what key you're in, they care about what they can possibly get away with. And it was really screaming out for a little Dorian flavor on the synth keyboard. So I decided to let the synths go crazy. I clicked in this whole keyboard solo using nothing more than my mouse, but you'll notice there's a lot of chromatics, there's a lot of natural sixth, a lot of things that break the minor rules. But that's what lead players are supposed to do. They're not supposed to say, oh, these chords came from this key and therefore I have to stay within those seven notes. No, a good lead player sees this chord progression and says, okay, yeah, they might have written this in minor, but you know what? Over this B-flat minor chord, I could play B-flat Dorian. And then when the E-flat minor comes up, maybe I should switch back to B-flat minor. So that's the mentality I was thinking here. I know it's not pure Aeolian, but hopefully you'll let me get away with it. So, putting that all together, here is what we get. done funking, but what we can do is take a lot of those ideas and just repurpose them into a tool song instead. And let me see how you might do that. Our original riff was in B flat minor, right? Let's move it way down to the key of D and let's slow it down too. And you can already hear this is starting to sound more tool-like. I'm going to make a few changes. I'm just going to get rid of some of these notes and let them ring out as open D notes instead. And what I'm going to be left with is this. I said this really sounds like a tool song to me already but it would sound even more like a tool song if you had it maybe playing on a bass guitar this is starting to sound like an intro already so i decided to add some creepy synthesizers and threw a frequency shifter on it with the ring mod automating that down slowly gave me a pretty haunting sound Now, 
just like before, I want to be thinking about chords. Even though this is just a riff, it's important to think about what chords could be supporting this. And if we listen to what a D minor would sound like, that's obviously the root. It's going to sound pretty good. And also the flat 6 chord, the diatonic 6 chord, would be a B flat major chord. And that's like, I'm a sucker for the flat 6. Any minor key, I think the flat 6 is like the coolest chord to play. So listening to what that sounds like underneath this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imply a little bit of D minor, very simply, with a guitar part that just does a D and a D and an A. And then to imply that flat 6 chord, B flat major, I'm going to do just two notes of the B flat major. I'm just going to do the B flat and the D. So by playing this little part, D, D, and A, and then D, D, and B flat, that's going to imply a shift of a D minor chord, that's my one chord, to my six chord, B flat major. Should really, you know, add interest to my simple little bass riff. Before we go any further, I gotta mention that you will be hearing Beardstank again on the drums here. He did a great job of really kind of amplifying this tool sound altogether through his use of polymeter and playing. So to me, this is a good intro, but it really needs to expand into something bigger, that, that thrashing riff. And now we'll take the same notes, but we will play them on an electric guitar instead of a bass. And we'll play them heavily distorted. We'll triple track it. I'm gonna record it three times so it just becomes this giant wall of guitars. easily turn that into a verse section just by toning it down doing it with palm mutes instead it makes a really nice bed for vocals so if we've got a verse riff we got to write some vocals i tried to take the same lyrics we had as before and put them into this song but, you know, I'm not a vocalist, and Melodyne can only do so much. It can't make you a good performer. So this should go to show you that, you know, even with the magic of pitch correction, I can't sing like Maynard. He's too good of a performer, and there's just certain things that pitch correction cannot do, and it certainly can't make me sound like the Tool Singer. But I tried. I One thing I want you to notice is the rhythm that I'm singing, that staccato rhythm, is built on the classic 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 pattern. I made an entire video on just that rhythm. Uh, to this day, I haven't gotten a conclusive answer on what it should be called, so I have opted to call it the Tresillo Supreme or the Tresillo Grande. Those both make sense if you know what a Tresillo is, and they both sound delicious. Anyways, that rhythm is being played and also accented by Beardstank the drummer, so we get a little bit of polymetric goodness in the middle of our verse, which is a real key feature of Tool's music. Now the last thing I could do to add to this Tool vibe is to just serve the entire song up to you while playing a slowly rotating Fibonacci spiral. genre. Let's try to recreate that iconic classic rock acoustic intro that we've heard a billion times before. This has been happening from the 60s up until today. It's still a very popular thing to do. And we'll pick the ever-present popular key of E minor, which has the chords G in it as the three chord. It also has an A minor as the four, and it has a C as the six. 
and I want to be thinking about these chords to write an acoustic intro riff. Before I start riffing though, let's make the chords more interesting. I could make this E minor an E minor add 9 by adding in an F sharp, and that really darkens up that chord even more. So let's do that. For G, I can add in the A right here and get a little bit of a G add 9. For A minor, let's drop the C note altogether and let's play an A suspended 2. So these notes are obviously still in the key of E minor. And then last, for C major, let's make it a C major 7 instead. And maybe sometimes make it a C add 9. And then maybe even sometimes make it a C add 9 with an added sharp 11. Right? Really kind of, or I'm going to call it a sharp 4 instead. So, you know, instead of just E minor, G, A minor, C, now we've got E minor add 9, G add 9, A sus 2, and then C add 9. Very cool variation of what we started off with. Now, instead of strumming those chords, let's pick through them. Let's arpeggiate them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to always start with the bass note. So for an E minor chord, I'm going to start with my bass playing an E. When the G comes around, what I'll do is I'll pick through the G note, but then I'll hammer on that ninth. And now for A, sus2, I'll just play through the notes of an A sus2 chord. And then for C, like before, we'll get a little bit of C major 7, starting picking on the C, but then I'll hammer on that ninth there. So what I get is this. Same chords as before, all diatonic to E minor, but we're picking through each chord, we're hammering on some of those cool little chord adjustments. Now, the second time around, it's almost the same thing. We're going to do a little scale run, G, F sharp, E, to get back to my home chord. And then here, I just play a regular G chord. Then we're going to move up to a D chord, which is the 7 chord, right? And then we can finally play another C. And this is that C add 9 with the sharp 11. So here's what that sounds like if you put it all together. Now one thing I like to do when I'm producing is to take an acoustic part and just double it with an electric guitar. A clean, heavily compressed electric guitar with maybe some chorus and reverb and a lot of the low end taken out. And this gives a nice little shimmery doubling effect. But I didn't double every single note. I kind of let some notes just ring out. So I got rid of about half the notes. So I played my electric part. Right? It's most of the notes that we started with, but it's less motion. And that way some of those notes sustain just a little bit longer. It's just a nice background layer for a simple acoustic guitar. There's still room for another soft layer here, so I decided to add some really low strings that are once again just outlining the chords, playing little dyads, two note chords, and every single two notes are two notes that are in the underlying chord. Now this is where things kind of got out of hand for me. I decided, hey, that sounds so good as an intro, let's make a verse section. So I took those same chords, E minor, and I just strummed them instead, G, and decided to start singing over the top of this. But I decided to use the same lyrics that we had from before about falling in love with somebody on a different planet. And the way I decided to sing it was to try to like emulate Creed and, and Nickelback. And it took me a really long time to get these vocals done because I kept laughing while I was trying to record it. It just seemed so ridiculous. What's also ridiculous is that I made it a point to sing yeah and whoa after every single lyric, just alternating between the two. And putting the whole thing together creates just some Frankenstein's monster amalgamation of like every alternative rock band you've heard since the 1990s. Secret, yeah, and the 
think I want to tell you Ooh, If you can only promise Yeah and That you won't go around and tell nobody else Whoa, I fell in love with someone Yeah And they from a different Can't get enough Yeah Of what they've got to give Now, if that wasn't me singing like that, and if I wasn't singing about those things, let's face it, that would probably be a pretty digestible and enjoyable and successful song from the listener's point of view. I think people would like to listen to that. In its current state, not so much. But there's a few things I want to bring up here. First thing is, I know many of you are wondering, where did you get that nice looking guitar? And I just want to shout out to my friends over at Close Guitars. They literally shipped this for me. They didn't ask for anything in return. I really appreciate that. And it's a great looking guitar. And if you want to film an acoustic guitar, this is the one I want to film. So I have left a link below in the description to get to their website if you're interested in getting something like this. But also, I do want to talk about what is the difference between the minor scale and the Aeolian mode. If I told you that I was writing a piece in the key of E minor, what I mean to you is that I'm going to be using this key signature, all right? But even using that key signature, you might see notes that are out of key, like a D sharp. It's very common to hear a D sharp note when you're in the key of E minor, but it's out of key. It's out of the minor scale. You also might see like a C sharp, the natural sixth. That's a very common thing to hear when you're in the key of E minor. So when I'm in E Aeolian, I think it kind of implies that we're not leaving any of the other notes. We're just only using the notes of the natural minor scale. But this is a very rare thing to do. It's very rare to restrict yourself to only the seven notes of natural minor. I don't really see a reason why you should call a song Aeolian unless you're trying to sound really smart and pretentious or if you really have a reason that you need to get across to the reader or the performer that like, hey, you will not see any accidentals ever in this. I hope that doesn't confuse things even further. But long story short, minor is Aeolian for the most part. So I hope this is an educational and entertaining lesson for you. If you did enjoy this lesson, please, you are going to have to thank my incredible Patreon supporters for sponsoring these lessons and keeping them going forward. Without them, these lessons would not be possible. If you'd like to join them, you can. There are links below in the description, but if you don't want to do that, please leave a like or a comment or a subscribe. All those things help me out. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.